Paul was somebody that was not satisfied to just do the blues the way it was done. He had to play his blues. Uh, you know, he picked it up from Little Walter and Big Walter and Sonny Boy and Muddy and Wolf and, and all the same people that everybody else at that time was listening to, but he took it further with his band. I think Paul was a trendsetter and uh, an individualist in the sense that he had his own style, unique style, and no one else had that before or after him. Or come up with something that you know that distinctive of his style that you could literally just say the first note, the first word out of his mouth, you knew who it was exactly. First guy would be John Lee Williamson, the original Sonny Boy. Everybody wanted to play like him. Okay, the next guy was Little Walter. The next guy after that is your dad. And that's really the way it is. There's, there's the three guys that people wanted to try to play like. When I got my first uh, Butterfield record in 71, I had no idea I'd be 40 some years later, I'd be, I'd be uh, you know, playing with, with his son you know, on a stage and, do, and, and, and reenacting to a certain degree, you know, what your father did. We're keeping him and everybody else, we're keeping the spirit alive. That's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. To me, it's more of a spiritual thing than just playing music. This right here is a dream come true. I've got an incredible amount of beautiful musicians that are just showing a lot of love for a story that needs to be told about a man, Paul Butterfield. And here tonight we're celebrating Paul Butterfield, his music, and we're also at home here in Woodstock at the Bearsville Theater. Let's go, Chicago. Station, search my mind for an explanation. 
Music was always meant to, to move forward. You know, it's not meant to just be a museum piece. And, uh, and, and Paul, um, you know, I, I got to hang out with Paul some, but I never really got to play much with him. He, uh, ever, from each album, if you look at each album, you go, what? By the Butterfield Blues album sounds, the first one sounds it's sort of traditional, but then there's some things that, you know, weren't being done in Chicago. You hear some New Orleans stuff and influences and, uh, and rock and roll was there for sure. Because these were young white kids for the most part with a black rhythm section. Unheard of, you know. Uh, he had an integrated band, which I always thought was the, the key to, to that band's success. Because, you know, you need the official swing that comes from Chicago, which Jerome and Sam had. But then he moved the band forward. You know, East West, the this, this second record, all of a sudden Michael's bringing in this Eastern influence and uh, you know there's there's a lot of different stuff going on and then the next record totally different band it's just each one is moving the music forward uh, right to the end one, two, three. We all called him the Honer Moner, but it's a small instrument, but the amount of physical labor that he put into playing it. When somebody takes that much air and expands his chest that wide and then his own over like this and up like this and all the, you know, ins and outs, I mean, that is hard to do. Yeah. And he's switching positions while he's doing it and adjusting the mic. Uh, you know, to get to just the right sound using his, using his hands as like a Harmon mute, like a trumpet player would. So many different sounds, you got this little tiny thing. Nobody else does that. I think he's long overdue for being in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Blues Hall of Fame and just, you know, elevate his stature and acknowledge the effect that he's had on uh, so many people and not, not just other people who play harmonica but other band leaders, you know, how somebody puts together a band and shapes it and then when it's reached its zenith, okay, that band is disbanded and we'll go on to this next conglomeration. When, when, you, when you saw Paul, when you heard him, I mean, he, he was the real deal. I mean, he was a great, great blues man, a great blues musician, and I mean, he just carried it with him. I mean, his whole vibe, his whole persona was of greatness, you know, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I've, I've played with, with Dylan Hendrix and other people, and, and Paul was just right in that same category. He was just something really special. The notes that he played were the right notes, you know, and, and the right feeling and, uh, I mean, his vocals too, his singing, everything, his whole band was so tight and he ran it like a band leader, you know, he was the man, you know.
I just want to say, I've been like on this sort of mission just to, to say Paul Butterfield Blues Band should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of, there would be no Bob Dylan, Highway 61, uh, you know, Rolling Stone wouldn't have happened without Bob seeing Paul's band and taking Michael from there, you know? And the Butterfield Blues Band and everything that stemmed from that bunch in Chicago, from Paul to Nick Gravenites and Electric Flag, you know, to, to, uh, the, to the Blues Project in New York, to Blood, Sweat and Tears, they're all being ignored for some reason. There's a chunk of music that really emanated out of Chicago and New York at that time where young white bands and mixed bands were playing the blues the way the Rolling Stones were. But actually, these guys had really been in the trenches with the real blues players. So, you know, Mike Bloomfield and your father were up on stage with Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf when they were kids. I will always have just this uh, total respect for everything they did and everything they set me up to do. And that's how I feel. They made me say, I can do this. I could do this too, you know. Walking blue.